Hi everybody, welcome back to uh, our bench here and to our next project. So what we have in front of us here is a Lafayette model LR441 quadraphonic receiver. And this one has kind of special meaning to me. I've been wanting to do one of these for a while because the very first stereo that I ever got was from this family. It was a Lafayette model LR 111 and that was kind of their entry-level quadraphonic receiver and uh, my uncle had it for a while and he gave it to me and uh, his son which is my cousin actually worked for Lafayette Radio Electronics as a bench tech so he got you can imagine how much Lafayette equipment <laughs> we went through back in the 1970s and that and the one the model that he gave me was an LR111 and the LR111 is kind of the smaller version of this it's only rated at about 7.5 watts per channel but it got incredibly loud for how low power it was and it was a very good performing receiver and at the same time uh, I purchased a with my money I saved <laughs> took a long time. I purchased a pair of Sonics, which is which was kind of like the low-end version of Pioneer. Uh, Three-way speakers. It had a 10-inch ported woofer, had a little four-inch paper cone mid-range, and a two-inch paper cone tweeter. And the crossover of the whole system consisted of two capacitors. <laughs> that was it. But they really sounded nice, uh, especially for those days but you know from what I had um, and I used that that receiver for a long time until I could afford to get something a little bit nicer or you know I always had older things you know from the flea markets that I would fix up but that was my stereo so I've always wanted to do and do one of these and we're gonna do this one so when I got this thing in I realized that uh, I kinda checked it in the tuning knob you can see it doesn't work it's kind of stuck it's not doing anything it's got some issues and I just took the cover off took a quick look inside it looks mostly original I don't think much work has been done on it but I do think that some work has been done on it uh, nothing really serious though and I really don't know how much of this thing works and doesn't work. That's what we're going to find out. But I'm definitely not going to plug it in. First thing I'm going to look at is this tuning system and uh, try to repair that first. And then we'll go from there. So if that sounds interesting, stay tuned. Okay, we're in. And take a look at all that 1970s goodness. <laughs> so turning the the knob here you can kind of see what's going on um, this is not engaged with the tuning gang so we're going to have to fix that first of all the other thing I notice is looking down here this is getting hung up on something so I'm not sure what that's all about but we're gonna have to figure that out as well so I'm going to mess around with this a little bit and I will show you uh, what I find here as uh, I want to take care of this first. So to fix this there's a few things you need to kind of know. On this little plastic gear here there's a little tab that sticks out and it's a stop and that stop tab will go around and it'll hit this little metal bracket in each direction. So what you want to do is you want to get it to the end of its travel in one direction against the stop. And then what you want to do is you want to, whatever direction it's, it's maxed out in, you want to move your pointer, dial pointer, until it's just beyond the dial scale. Uh, that'll get you into a rough area where it needs to be. Now, in this instance, I'll move this over here. In this instance, it's turned all the way to the, high, the highest frequency which is 108 and if you kind of look at what direction it's going it's turning this way 
So that means it should be maxed out the whole this the whole way this way. If this plastic gear is rotating this direction, that means the tuning gang gear has to be rotated the whole way this way. So in order to do that, you just want to carefully take a you know a screwdriver or type of tool, and you want to move your your gang here, your tuning gang, your capacitor all the way to its maximum travel in that direction, which there it is right there. Now, the other thing is, I don't know how far I can get in without it losing its focus. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. But if you look over here, I'll try to keep this at an angle you can see. There's a little spring loaded. There's, there's two little toothed plates and they're against one another and they have this little spring kind of separating them apart. So in other words, these two little plates, I'll back off here, these two little plates are like this, and that little spring kind of forces them together. So whenever you separate those plates, like with respect to one another like this, those that spring, which is right in here, will try to force it back to this direction. So what you're going to do is you're going to kind of pull them one tooth over and then there's always going to be this spring tension trying to push the two plates apart back to this position. What that's going to do is that's going to cause it to actually grip this little plastic gear down here. And by gripping it, you're going to take out that backlash. So you have your plastic gear and your metal gear and they have play in them. And you don't want that play in there because every time you move the plastic gear without moving the metal gear, you're making the dial pointer go back and forth, but you're not actually moving the capacitor. So what you want is you want them to be meshed tightly so that when they turn, any movement is going to make both of them move and track very accurately. So a lot of times this thing will come loose and people will come in and they'll just mesh it back together and they won't squeeze those two plates apart to put tension on them. And then they'll wonder why their tuning gang you know why the tuning is so sloppy when they adjust it and especially if you're going to do alignment you're going to find out that you can't get it to track now getting this to <laughs> spring apart and put it all together can be a little bit tricky um, first of all usually the little screw here that takes this all apart is hard to get to it's a Phillips head screw but really this plastic thing is in the way you know the and you don't want to really take the dial string off because that's not easy to deal with. So what I do is I kind of move this up out of the way and I just put very slight tension so I can slide it still. Then what we're going to do is we're going to push this plate on the, the inner plate. We're going to push them apart to put tension on that spring. See what that's doing? So just like that. Then I'm going to slide this down in and lock it into place like that. So now there's tension in there. If I let this go right now, that spring will kind of pop those back apart. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tighten this a little more tightly. And then we should be able to rotate the tuning gang. And you can see, no matter how tiny I move that, you can see both gears move together with one another. See that? So that's all there is to it. Now the only thing left to do is to actually adjust the dial pointer so that it comes in properly and moves smoothly. And it's mechanically binding as well, so we're going to have to figure that one out. But that's how you repair this if this thing comes decoupled. That can happen. Sometimes this screw will come loose and the the gear will decouple from that plate and you have to put it back together and that's how you do it. Okay to set the dial pointer on this thing you want to run this all the way down until it hits the end stop of the tuning gang and once it does there's a little zero there you see the see the little zero on the scale when the dot when the tuning gang is all the way meshed together you want the dial pointer to be directly over that zero 
just like that. See, now it's stopped. It won't go any further. And once you set it to there, your dial pointer is, is properly set, or is le at least going to be very, very close. Now, this little pointer up here, if we back off a little bit, you can actually, if you hold the the gang, you know, the string so it doesn't move, you can actually slide this ever so slightly without damaging the string. It just has a little crimp that's holding it, but it's not crimped on there. Usually it's not crimped so hard that it will damage the dial string. You can slide it ever so slightly. So that's how you do that. And now our tuning gang should be somewhat aligned, at least close enough that we should be able to do alignment when we get to that part. Now, to get the faceplate off, it's pretty straightforward. There's two screws on either side that takes the faceplate off. And first, you have to remove the knobs. And one thing very interesting about Lafayette is these are some of the highest quality machined knobs I've ever seen. Uh, they actually have set screws. Um, and for instance, remember, this is a quadraphonic receiver, meaning that it's four channels. It's not two channels like stereophonic. So your bass, your treble, and your balance, and your volume all have front and rear controls. So this is a dual potentiometer. There's one potentiometer here and one here. And those knobs are actually split. And each has their own set screw. So you can actually adjust the bass and treble and the balance independently of one another between the front and the rear. And you can also adjust the volume over here for the front and the rear independently. Although they're friction fit, so if you just grab the knob and turn it, it will turn both equally at the same time. So it's pretty cool. You know, these things kind of get overlooked. Uh, and they kind of get cashed off as not very good quality electronics. But as you're going to see throughout this, it's a decent and well-built little setup. It's nothing fancy. But uh, for instance, the SQ encoder for the Quadraphonic is actually pretty good on these compared to the other ones of this generation. This is an earlier generation of Quadraphonic. And back then, they didn't get very good front to rear separation um, using the SQ encoder or decoder. This one actually does a pretty good job. It's, there's, the later ones are better yet, but this one really holds its own um, for what it is. We'll get more into that later. Now the amplifier section couldn't be more straightforward. This PC board is split up into four sections and you have the um, one, two, three, and four channels, and each one has two transistors. And this little amplifier is a little better than my LR111. Uh, the main difference is this one's a little higher power. It's, it's a whopping 11 watts per channel or something around there, 11.5 or something. And again, this is really, it's a 10 watt receiver. It's 10 watts times four. Um, when you start getting that 11, 11.5, your, your total harmonic distortion climbs up pretty quickly up above 1%. So really this is a 10 watt receiver. Uh, you can see they just use this glue stuff and they glued the thermistors here, these little thermal devices for the thermal tracking right onto this little metal plate. All four of them have come loose, you can see. So we'll need to glue those back on. But really, none of the components look heat stressed. This is using four of those uh, TO66 type transistors. They look like mini TO3 transistors. Uh, Lafayette reused those in a lot of their receivers from this era. And remember, these are the early predecessor to the uh, TO220 transistors that we now use, the modern ones. They actually have the same pin spacing with one another and can actually drop in replace. And even, even the distance from the tab to the pins completely lines up. You can see right there. So you can actually, if we need to, we can use a modern replacement. And I showed that in the Marantz uh, Model 15 video that we did. 
but I think all of these ones may be okay. I don't know. Well, hopefully they will, because I really want to maintain all the original components if I can, with the exception of recapping it and maybe replacing a couple of the potential noisy transistors. But these are those good metal cased, very high quality transistors. They used really high quality components in these, believe it or not. So really the only thing this may need is just a recap and an alignment. It's pretty clean inside. I've done nothing to it. There's a little bit of dust and dirt that you would expect from something from the early 1970s. But for how old it is, it's held up pretty well. Now looking at the rear of the amplifier, I'll show you down through there. If you look through those little holes, this is the heat sink, you can kind of see those TO66 transistors. I don't know how well you can see them from here, but they're all in there. And I don't know if the lighting helps or not. And then moving to the rear, this looks a little bit different than your standard stereo receiver. <laughs> so first of all, there's a set of, these are your main speakers and you can see right and left front, right and left rear. Each one has a little fuse protection for it. And yes, all the audio files are cringing because there's fuses and all then and there's decoupling capacitors because of the amplifier design. We'll talk about that later. But I checked them all. The fuses are all good and they're all the correct ratings and they don't look like they've been replaced, including the power fuse. You always want to check that first. If there's different fuses in here, the wrong sizes or something, that's a pretty good indication that something might be wrong and you don't want to plug this thing in because you may cause some pretty bad damage to it. Uh, Lafayette also was big on little RCA jacks for the remote speakers. So you can, they actually had inexpensive speakers you could buy through their catalog that just had had the wires and the RCA plugs built right in and you just plugged them in. They weren't super high <laughs> quality speakers, but hey, they worked. Um, the most interesting is the inputs. And you can see for the tape deck and so forth and the auxiliary inputs, it actually had discrete four channel inputs. So if you didn't want to run this in stereo mode, if you wanted stereo mode, you used this top set of jacks up here. If you wanted to run it in four channel mode, which you could select from the connections in the front, you actually had four discrete inputs. So if you had a quadraphonic, like a four channel uh, cassette, or uh, I'm sorry, reel to open reel tape deck, you could plug it right into here. Or if you had an external quadraphonic decoder, you could plug it right into the auxiliary jacks and you had two sets of auxiliary jacks, which is nice. It has an FM detector output, so you could plug into a scope or any number of things. They had different uh, options. The, it has a switchable input for the phono. And you can see it had a standard two-channel tape deck for like cassette. And then your phono inputs right here. And the phono input is very important. The phono stage on this is actually a pretty decent one. and that's because most of the quadraphonic material you would purchase would be on vinyl. So you would use your your uh, your turntable through this jack and it would use the quadraphonic decoder that's built in for SQ. It, this does not have CD4 and we'll talk more about the different types of quadraphonic later. But it would use this and it would convert this stereo encoded signal that comes in in stereo and it decodes it into the four channel. So, and again, it has the low and high input for uh, the, the matching. Some of these actually had magnetic, this one has high and low magnetic cartridge, but some of the older ones actually, and I think my LR111 had uh, magnetic and then even a ceramic cartridge, which ceramic turntable cartridges have a similar output to a line level like your mp3 player. They have a higher voltage output than a magnetic and they're different impedance and so forth but that's another video. So that's the receiver. 
So I think uh, I'm going to flip it over and look at the underneath, make sure there's nothing burned or what obvious, and then we're going to try to power it up. Okay, and we can see this thing was built in October 26th of 1973. And we take the bottom cover off. And there you go. And you can see how densely packed some of these boards are. So, and underneath here, I believe, is where the quadraphonic decoding circuitry is for the SQ. I'm not 100% sure. I have to go over and look through it a little bit. This is the first I've worked on one of these types. But uh, <laughs> you can see how tight everything is on these boards. So they're a lot of fun to work on. I know my LR111 was very similar. It, it was quadraphonic also, but it wasn't as good of a, as a quad circuit as this one. And it was lower wattage, but it was every bit as densely packed. And the amplifier on it was actually like this. It wasn't much bigger than this little board here. And <laughs> it had all four channels on it with four little tiny transistors for the seven watts per channel. And uh, really hard to work on, let me tell you. So everything looks clean. It doesn't look like it's been worked on, and uh, that's good news, I guess. So this should be a good candidate for uh, restoration. So before we connect speakers to this, you have to understand that this amplifier does not have a speaker protect circuit, and it doesn't need one because normally, if you uh, when you look at this, the way that this is called a single rail push-pull design. So if you look, there's a single power rail, it's 50.5 volts, and then this goes directly to ground. And what that means is the way this thing is biased, this center point right here is going to be at about half of the rail voltage. It's going to be sitting at, you know, 20 volts. It's, see there, 25 volts, they even say it. And so if you were to connect a speaker directly to that, you would be putting 25 volts directly through the voice coil of your speaker to ground. So with a single rail push-pull amplifier like this, they actually will put this decoupling capacitor in here. It's a thousand microfarads at 35 volts in this instance. And what that does is that isolates that DC voltage from your speaker. Now, what it also will do is when you first apply power to the amplifier, this capacitor will charge up through the voice coil of your speaker. So you, you will hear on these little stereos, you will, will hear a little bit of a pop uh, as that cap first charges up through your speaker. It won't hurt the speaker, but what it will do is it will make that popping sound. And then once that happens, then the speaker will be sitting at that potential and then the only signal that will get through there will be the AC or the, the sound itself. So this capacitor is very critical. And what we want to do is before we connect speakers, we want to power the amplifier up and we want to verify that there are no shorts in that capacitor. If that capacitor is shorted, all of that DC voltage will go right through your voice coil. So what we're going to do is we are going to put a little resistor, like a little 8 ohm resistor across here, let it charge up through that resistor, and then we're going to measure it. And it's not going to be a big enough resistor to hurt anything. But we just want something for the cap to charge through, and then we can measure it. Once we know that there's no shorts in our capacitors there, which I highly doubt there will be, then it's safe to hook our speakers up. It's just a precaution on an unknown amplifier of this type. All right, I now have just a 1K resistor across each of the four speaker terminals. Why 1K? Well, if you take 1K and you do the math with 25 volts, that's going to limit the current if those capacitors are dead shorted to just a little over half of a watt. And these are one watt metal film resistors. So they'll get warm, but it won't damage anything. They'll, they'll limit the current, and they will still allow the capacitor to charge, and they will have a nice voltage drop across them to measure if the cap is actually shorted. Now, if the cap is leaky, you'll see a little bit of voltage across there. But, it should, but if there's no leakage, then it should 
go to zero volts. So we're set to DC. We'll move this over a little bit and let's turn the amplifier on. And you can see it charge and then it drops down. And you could see it's zero volts. There you have it. Then if we go over to the next channel, they should all be like this. And you could see no voltage there. No voltage there. No voltage there. So that means that our capacitors are either really very, very slightly leaky if, or not leaky at all. But the good news is they're not shorted and it is safe to put our speakers on there. Now you notice that quick charge and then discharge through that resistor. You're gonna see when we hook that speaker up, you're gonna hear a little pop and that's that capacitor charging through the speaker. Again, it's not enough of a surge current or anything to damage the speaker but you will hear it. Some people really hate that and it scares them, but it's normal. That's how these work, brand new. So let me take the microphone here and we'll put it next to the speaker and I'll show you that little, or let you listen to that little pop and then we'll see if this thing works. And that's really all there was to it. That tiny little sound, that was it. So let's turn it up. And I have an antenna connected. I'm Paul Lanier. if you didn't have a hand. I would say that is a really sensitive tuner, and I'm not going to touch it. Um, now one thing I do notice with the volume all the way down, I don't know if you heard that, I put the microphone right up the speaker, it's got some pretty nasty AC hum, which tells me that these capacitors are getting tired and they need replaced. Well I spoke too soon, yes that's 171 degrees Fahrenheit. I didn't check this heat sink uh, while I was working. But in the time that I was doing this, you know, I turned it off, went to disconnect the wires, and I felt this heat rising up off this heat sink. And I mean, it is burning your hand hot. Obviously, one of these channels has a very severe bias problem. Um, <clears throat> that might be one of the reasons that, it, that we were hearing that filter hum. It's drawing down on the power supply so heavily. So before we do anything and that's a, probably the reason that this that these all came disconnected it probably got so hot that it melted the glue on these and they popped off so there is definitely a problem in this amplifier and uh, we're going to have to look and see it sounds perfect it, I don't hear any problems the only thing I can figure is there is a very serious bias problem in here and uh, I don't want to leave it turned on long enough to find out without going into the instructions and taking a look at this. But definitely a problem there. <laughs> 200 degrees Fahrenheit, that's almost, you know, uh, that's hot. So time for a little update here. The first thing they tell you in the instructions is... And they, they just show you how to do the first channel and they want you to turn the pot all the way up but I left it where it was in its maximum position and this is for your bias um, or I'm sorry your DC balance adjust and they have you check with the DC voltmeter and they want oh, I'm sorry RV402 is your bias they want that all the way maximum position but I'm leaving them as is and they basically just have you checking on the collectors. Let's see where I see that. Uh, right here on Q2. And they want to 
set it for 25.5 volts. So essentially, these little test points here, and I added these little loops on here, it's a lot easier to hook onto. They all tested close. I mean, they're somewhere in the line of anywhere from 23 to 26 volts. So they're off a little bit, but not nothing to cause that kind of problem with this heat. So the next thing they have you do is they have you remove the fuses. And I do stand corrected. I called those fuses speaker fuses. They are not. Each individual amplifier module has its own two amp fuse. So those fuses are if the amplifier overloads, it's not the speaker <laughs> lead that's going to pop open. It's the actual fuse feeding the whole amp module that'll pop. So there's four of them in there. They want you to remove those fuses and they want you to clip your little amp meter where the fuse would be. So essentially you're just reading the quiescent current of this module when it's just sitting idle, right? So, and according to this, you should only see about 200 milliamps, which is, that's what I would expect an idle current for, for this to be, especially this small of an amplifier. You want somewhere around that 20 milliamps. Now, coming back to here, this is pretty service friendly the way they do this. You just take the four screws out of the side and this whole thing just swings down. It's really nice, the rear panel. I've removed, removed the fuses. And if we put our meter into amp mode and we grab one of these here, we just hook on to the lead. And you can see that it just has one power feed going all the way around. So all four fuse sockets are fed. Uh, by one power lead and if I plug the amplifier in now there's not going to be any power to the to the amp modules now so we don't have to worry about overloading anything so I have the amp powered up and let's just randomly grab one of these helps to plug the probe into the right place on your meter so you connect this on and yeah, your eyes are not deceiving you. There's 270 milliamps there, and it's climbing. Now, so you say, well, this channel must be bad. Well, we'll go to the other one. 300 milliamps and climbing. How about the other one? 200 milliamps and climbing. And the last one, 280, 290 and climbing. So what does this all tell us? Well, coincidence of all four channels failing at the same time, I don't know. I'm, I'm very skeptical of that. So I went over here and I looked at these pots that they want you to, I purposely did not move all the way, right? And looking at them, and I don't know if you're going to be able to pick this up in the camera, because the, but here's your four pots that they want you to, they wanted you to turn to maximum. See there. So in other words, clockwise turns the bias all the way down, and counterclockwise, see, I'm sorry, turns it all the way up. I believe, and you can see where. This right here is the little mark. You see the little tick marks on there? Every single one of these are off of their tick marks. They're not where the... And looks like those are factory marks on there. I'm not sure, but... I'm wondering if somebody didn't understand what they were doing and they thought by cranking that up they could get more power out of the amplifier. The golden tweaker strikes again. So let's just check this out now. I'm going to take the potentiometers and I'm going to rotate them all the way uh, to maximum just as the uh, service manual recommends. And let's just see if that's what our problem is. Okay, so I have the pots all set to maximum like the instructions say. 
let's hook up channel one and look at that 10 milliamps channel 2 10 milliamps channel 3 about 13 milliamps and channel 4 about 11 milliamps so this poor little receiver is the victim of the golden tweaker I'm just really happy that it doesn't appear that anybody tried to mess around with the with the tuner portion of this and just tried to get more power out of their amplifier uh, this is the old CB radio curse you know people that, that get CB radios and they go in the final section and they crank everything to the max thinking they getting more power and uh, of course <laughs> all you're getting is more heat so now I'm going to go through and I'm going to adjust it properly and hopefully this will take care of it so I'm just finishing up the very last adjustment of the last channel here and I'm just going to float it right around that 19 to 20 milliamps which is just fine and that's it all four channels are tweaked we can get this out now and I can remove this meter probe before I blow my fuse because you don't want to do that and we put our fuse back in the socket and all four channels are now set properly and I went through and I just measured my four test points and set my center point for 25.5 volts and that's just as simple as turning these four pots up in the front and that's your DC balance and uh, that's all there is so now I'm going to clean these up and reattach them to the little tabs so that they can do their job now. Um, luckily we didn't have to worry about that because this adjustment was to be done at room temperature with absolutely no heat on the heat sink so this had to totally cool down to room temperature and I would unplug the amplifier in between moving things around so it was only on long enough just to set that idle current that's it so the amplifier is working that's really good news um, but just for those of you who are new to this or who don't work on amplifiers a lot whatever anybody tells you cranking the bias up on any amplifier whether it's transistorized or if it's tube it doesn't matter cranking up the bias voltage will not give you any more power it won't do anything for you except make the amplifier idle at a very high current and run too hot it'll damage components the whole purpose of bias is to get the get the amplifier to to a turned on state <clears throat> to eliminate crossover distortion um, that's the whole idea is you're 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 eliminating distortion it's the bare minimum that the amplifier needs to be turned on to operate if you crank the bias up you're going to do really the opposite of what you're trying to do because you're not allowing that amp to have the full swing of the power supply voltage if you're starting it already partially up so don't do it <laughs> and if you don't have the instructions of how to set the bias of a certain amplifier and you don't understand how the circuit works to, to know yourself what it should be don't attempt to do it um, it'll save you a, a lot of problems in the long run and before we put the back cover back on I just want to show you these transistors these are original Sankin uh, components they're very high quality output transistors believe it or not they're not super high output but they use top shelf components when they built this this is a very well built amplifier I'm really surprised at uh, the components that you're seeing in here well we got it all recapped and uh, new thermal epoxy gluing the little thermal 
devices onto the heat sink and everything's aligned as we did a little bit earlier in the video now the only thing I did not do was clean the controls and there are noisy controls on this so we're going to have to fix that and we'll do that when we get into the to the uh, preamp section I'm just gonna probably recap the preamp section I don't know yet it need it you know probably should do it for maintenance but I don't think it's gonna affect the function of it right now so let's uh, Part of the things is I have the knobs removed right now, so I'm not sure <laughs> where the middle is here on the base and treble. We don't have a tone defeat control on this thing, so and if the tone controls are on, it'll way throw off these readings. But anyway, we're connected to our 8 ohm dummy load. We have a one kilohertz signal going in, and we have our noisy controls. Let's see what this thing does. You can kind of see right there's clipping right about there and I'm getting 29 watts per channel 20 28 you can just see at the bottom where I'm sitting it just starting to clip and it clips pretty pretty symmetrically and you can see as I move the knob all the noise but that's good we're getting 27 watts per channel I didn't think this thing had that kind of output surprisingly enough I'll have to check the specs on this again remember what it said. I thought this thing was only 12 watts per channel, but maybe I'm wrong. Let's check it out. Well, of course they have crazy ratings here. Of course they're saying this is one of those ones where they were doing the, yeah, 28 watts times 4. Oh, sorry. You're not seeing that, are you? So 28 watts times 4 at 8 ohms. So yeah, that's right, 28 watts. Excellent. So the amplifier is working very well, and now that we have the idle current and everything set properly, the heat sinks are ice cold. Now one other thing I did, I made a couple little mods here to make things a little better. It's not going to make a huge difference, but it will make a difference um, especially with kind of the dynamic range of this or the uh, kind of dynamic signals where you have a rapid change in amplitude on something. The first thing I did was if you look inside this little heat sink you see this little red wire here what I did was I actually ran a heavier gauge primary wire to the amplifier module. They had that th hair thin piece of uh, primary lead coming from the capacitor, your main power supply, it went all the way under here, all the way around, and up into here. And then it kind of split off to the four different fuse sockets which fed the four different power modules. And of course, you know, you're looking at 30, let's say 30 watts times four, right? That's 120 watts of power going through that hair thin wire. Of course the wire can carry that, but obviously it's going to have some resistive value and it is going to change, uh, you know, kind of bog down a little bit during a real high power transient, like a heavy bass note or something. So that heavier wire should help that a little bit. In addition, they originally had just little one microfarad capacitors coming into each module, here, 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 and here. And uh, those are just directly filtering the input. Now what that does is that'll remove any kind of noise that may be developed through like a, a loop or something from that power lead being so long and it also will assist with the higher frequencies uh, of the amp but it really again it you, you have a pretty long run into there so I up these to a hundred microfarads. It's not going to hurt a thing and what it's going to do is it's going to help us a little bit with uh, that dynamic power again. And uh, I'll tell you, I listened to this a little bit through the tuner, and it sure sounds nice. It really has a lot of punch to it for how small this little amplifier is. I did not have a 3300 microfarad capacitor 
at 63 volts to replace this. So I left this in for the time being. It's fine. And that hum totally went away once we got our, uh, our uh, idle current set properly. So that hum that you were hearing was excessive current being drawn through this circuit. And between the size of this capacitor, the size of your transformer, and that thin wire, you were actually hearing some AC hum because you were drawing so much, so much uh, constant current by having all these things turned way up higher than they should be. So once we got rid of that, it got rid of the hum. So that's going to end part one of this uh, restoration. I'm going to get this little video posted and then when we come back we're going to look at the tuner section. I'll probably off camera just go ahead and recap the, the uh, tone control and preamp section uh, just for good measure because I'm going to keep this receiver and I kind of want to get it all baselined here. And uh, I, we know that we have to change the dial accuracy. It's way off. What we don't know is it looks like somebody moved the dial pointer at some time because they mess, somebody messed around with it. And then when they hit the end stop, they tried to force it because it was, of course, stopping. And that's what kind of popped this thing off. So I think it just, at that point in time, they gave up. So by resetting the dial pointer to where it should be and the tuning gang where it should be, we're going to have to go in and reset our oscillator. That might be the only thing that they messed with. I don't know if anybody has tweaked any of the other alignments, but judging by the sensitivity of this receiver and how, how sensitive it is, I don't think they messed with any of the IF or anything like that. So we may luck out there. But that's it for this video. And again, as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health. I thank you all for your nice comments. And uh, things are going to be picking up at work for me. They've started already. Uh, you know, the hospitals are starting to call, and they're starting to need a little more attention in the department. So I don't know how regularly I'm going to be putting out videos from this point on. It'll be sometimes I'll have time, and sometimes I won't. So it sure has been fun doing a few of them here over the last couple weeks. But anyway, we'll be back soon. And until then, stay well and take care. Bye-bye.